our next speaker is uh, Thomas Benz from the ETH Zurich um, on the topic of Puma, an end-to-end -end open source Linux capable RISC-V SOC in 130 nanometers. Um, he's a PhD student at ETH and uh, without further ado, Thank you for the introduction, and as you can clearly see from my slide, there will be no talk about Puma today, but rather on Iguana. There was unfortunately a bit of an issue when unblinding our title. So I will talk about Iguana, our end-to-end, open-source, Linux-capable, RISC-V SOC in 130 nanometer CMOS. Let's start with the situation and challenges of the open-source world in terms of open-source silicon. You all know that free and open source RTL has been established for quite some time. And this led to major increases in hardware research output. For example, most of our pulp IPs, they are only possible because we can do them in the open and also access other contributions. In terms of free and open source synthesis and backend, those tools are still under development. Once they are completely done, this will be really the next frontier. What about if we combine them both together, so fully open hardware? There are projects, and one of the most important ones is the Caravel SOC from eFabless, which is taped in Skywater. And uh, this is the, the SOC, and most of it is the, the Caravel SOC, and the user can have some additional um, payload where they can implement their own design. This is unfortunately quite limited because it only allows the user to use 10 square millimeter, which is not much hardware, in 130 nanometers. And it also limits the I.O. capabilities because all of the I.O. needs to go through the Caravel SOC. Skywater is not a European technology, so at the moment we do not have a fully European solution. So what are our contributions to this situation? We are implementing Iguana. This is our SOC that is based around CVA6 in IHP's 130 nanometer node. It will tape out early July through Euro practice. It will then be the first end-to-end -end fully open source ASIC capable of running Linux standalone. We are, we are given a custom pet frame which allows us full control over all of the IOs. It is, again, taped in IHP's open European PDK in a fab in Germany. We are building Iguana from industry-grade IPs. This is mainly built around the Cheshire SOC framework, which allows us to create Linux-capable SOCs centered around CVA6. We are also including two fully digital and open source off-chip interfaces. One is a hyperbus DRAM interface, which allows us to ex uh, access external memory, and a chip-to-chip -chip link to connect multiple iguanas together. We are providing a full set of peripherals, which really allows us to have a standalone usable mini computer. We verify the Linux boot and the rest of iguana through FPGA, and a previous developed silicon demonstrator. I have talked now a lot about Iguana, so let's go and make a deep dive into the architecture. Again, the goal is to have a standalone Linux bootable computer centered around CVA6. We are using AXI4 as the main memory interconnect and RecBus to access the low performance peripherals. We include an AXI-based last-level cache, which can be configured as SPM if required. We have a wide set of peripherals. This includes VGA for display output, uh, JTAG for debug, UART, SPI, I2C, and also GPIOs. Iguana has two standalone boot modes. First is over SPI, for example, an SD card, and the other one is I2C. We have the two fully open source digital only files. So directly attached to the LLC, there is the hyperbus to access the external memory. And the chip to chip link is directly connected to the AXI crossbar, both as a master and as a slave. Iguana is built around Cheshire, which is our silicon proven Linux SOC framework. 
And because we have this framework already in place, we get a free FPGA port with that. It uses a parameterizable top and um, an approach that we call IHLS, IP-based high-level synthesis, for all of the IPs that cannot easily be parameterized. For them, we are regenerating them or using template, reassemble them. And this really allows us to create complex top-level designs with ease. You can check it out. It's freely available on our GitHub page. Cheshire was verified, and thus also Iguana will be verified so through a silicon demonstrator. This is Neo, and this is actually a die shot. This is not an artistic rendering, and it was taped last year. In TSMC's 65 nanometer node, but with a closed tool chain. It's a very similar SOC, but a slightly different DRAM controller. We have already tested Neo, and it is working standalone. Before I'm going into the tool chain now, front end and back end, I want to talk a bit about the tools that we created uh, in order to bridge the gap in the open flow. First, we have Bender. Bender is a source and dependency management tool, which also allows us to generate compile scripts. This sounds now probably very familiar to some of you because it's very similar to Fuse SOC with a very important difference that it can also resolve um, project dependencies automatically. Morty can take a, a bunch of sources and create a single file, single compile context, which is much easier to handle. In the process, it does the macro expansion, the system very log macros. And finally, we have SVAs, which does a parameter and generate pre-elaboration of system Verilog. It, in the end, creates human-readable, simplified system Verilog. And we use this to bridge the gap between our complex industry-grade IPs and the system Verilog capabilities of the open tools. SLANG, uh, sorry, SVAs is based around the SLANG parser and it uses it as, as its, its main engine. Now, let's get over to the front end. So this is the ideal case. We start from the RTL, go directly through the synthesizer, and get the netlist. Unfortunately, reality is usually a bit more complex, so we use Bender and Morty to collect the sources, which then gives us the single compile context. We use SVAs to do the parameter elaboration, the unification, and the simplification. And now it's possible that SV2V can read it. It then converts it down to pure Verilog, which can be handled by Yosis, which generates our netlist. The backend flow is very standard. We are just using open road and K layout. But with one difference, we, are, we have created a custom tickle-only flow. This flow is based on our traditional cockpit flow, which we have developed over the course of the last 37 years, or with experience of 37 years of taping out chips. It is much simpler, and especially for our undergrad students, it's more in line with our teaching efforts. Of course, we did not throw the open road flow scripts completely away, but we only took out the technology and tool information from them, and thus created the best out of tool worlds with this tickle-only flow. We implemented Iguana using just a top-down top design hierarchy, so it's just implemented completely flat. And as you can see here from the floor plan, the upper two-thirds is just CVA6, so most area, area is actually occupied by the core. Unfortunately, with Open Road, we have a bit of issues, and our largest issue at the moment is that it has a very, very high turnaround time of around 33 hours to implement this design. And this is just because many of the steps of open road are implemented single-threaded. To dig a bit deeper into the results, we have done a lot of contributions to the uh, free and open source flow during this project, which incl includes mostly bug fixes and improvements to the existing tools, but also we created some of our own tools and also open source them to bridge the gap. We demonstrate that a complex free and open source design can be used within the uh, free and open source flow. Additionally, we improved IHP's open standard cell. We had two hackathons at ETH, 
even with undergraduate students, in cooperation with Hochschule Rhein-Main. On the GDS side, we are, of course, targeting a fully open source GDS. At the moment, this is unfortunately not yet possible because the SRA macros and the IO cells are still closed. Their opening will be imminent. It's just an issue of licensing and some battles that lawyers need to fault out. We fit the design in 40 square millimeter in the 130 nanometer node, and our newest runs show that if we are extremely conservative with the worst case corners, we should achieve a frequency that is higher than 50 megahertz. To conclude this talk and give an outlook, we have created a Linux-capable RV64GC RISC-V SOC built around CVA6. It has two fully open source uh, off-chip files, one for the DRAM and one for a chip-to-chip -chip link. It uses industry-grade system Verilog IPs developed within the Pulp group, and we implemented it using an open-road backend with our custom cockpit flow. It will tape out through Euro practice soon, in around three weeks, and will then be the first end-to-end -end free and open source Linux-capable ASIC. We also have by then established the free and open source flow for complex designs. Iguana will not be the last in the line of those open source chips from ETH. We have future tape-out plants, namely Tego and Komodo. Both of them will carry scientific workloads. Examples for that are multi-core coherent CVA6, real-time SOC to going towards automotive application, aging sensors, and also side channel prevention. Thank you for your attention, and I'm now open for any questions. I mean, this is now getting quite exciting. So you're doing a full desktop, and you prepare your next papers with that desktop, presumably. Iguana papers prepared with Iguana. <laughs> and uh, just curious, I mean, of course, you want to have a faster design and all that. But apart from that, infrastructure rise, is it all there? Or are there other bigger lackings towards, uh, say, laptop? I mean, if you really want to have a full desktop, then probably also want to have Ethernet and USB. We have, uh, or we are currently developing an Ethernet IP, which uh, is also open source, of course. And hopefully, we can integrate this in a, in a next iteration. And for USB, at the moment, there are no plans. But if there is somewhere a USB IP that we can integrate, we are happy to do that, and of course, make a, a next few steps towards that goal to actually at some point having a fully, fully, fully open source laptop. Well, before I let you go, I actually have a question as well. Um, you, you mentioned it's a Linux desktop capable system. Um, so I'm wondering what kind of frequencies and not just frequencies, what kind of performance do you achieve both in the 65 nanometer process and in the 130 nanometer process? I, I'm not sure if I, I'm able to uh, do a comparison here between the numbers because one was created with a fully closed pipeline and one is now in the open. So I guess I'm not legally allowed to do that comparison here. But there is a, a paper on Neo, so if you want, you can check it out. Okay, so, so you've sidestepped it. Well, I'll read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you a lot for the presentation. Um, I'll stop destroying the, the stage here and <laughs> introduce the next speaker. So thank you again.